Hi, I'm Chrissy Carvanides Dushenko, UCLA's Head of Costume Design. Welcome to the Design Showcased West Salon. Today, our panel features costume designers from three Netflix series. Claire Parkinson from The Politician, Wendy Partridge from Shadow and Bone, and Ellen Mirajnik from Bridgerton. We'll start with scenic previews for each of these Netflix shows, followed by conversations with our panelists on their costume design creative process. Then we will ask our guests for career suggestions for the Design Showcased West event at UCLA. This is a week long event featuring more than 70 graduating designers sharing their masters of fine art portfolios from 16 different universities, all of them embarking on a career in entertainment design. Now let's go on to our first guest, Claire Parkinson with a brief introduction. She's the costume designer of The Politician, both season one and season two. She's based both New York and LA, and she has an Emmy nomination from the season one of The Politician shared with Lou Eirich and the assistant costume designer, Lily Parkinson. She's also known for her incredible work on The Mick and Wilfred. So without further delay, let's see our first clip of scenes featuring Claire Parkinson's contemporary costume designs for the season two of The Politician. I'm curious about your relationship with your father. Why? I know he's in prison, but what about before that? Was he an egoist, a little cruel? That's none of your business. He was a bit of a megalomaniac though, wasn't he? I refuse to sit here and listen to this. But it sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'm going to uh, give you a moment to discuss. I want a revote. I am not throwing away a 30 year political career for some frigging coin toss. Duty, you gotta stay calm. Let's talk about the trend lines. I understand that she lost everyone important to her when Sir Jorah and Masande and the other dragon died. But are they saying that every woman who goes through a hard time goes completely psycho? Can we talk about something else? We are in a climate emergency. California emission standards are being threatened. Our agribusinesses can't find workers. Wildfire season is year round. And manufacturers are abusing our lax organic labeling law. So Claire, this is such an amazing project with such an incredible cast of characters. Your research from what you had shared in previous conversations, the research is a process that's um, drawn from many different time periods, everything from the 60s, the 1980s, the 70s, and you're looking at icons from all different walks of life, from rock and roll to politicians, Jackie O, Annie Hall, David Bowie. Let's take a look at the first slide and explain your process of how you came about creating these characters. Yeah, um, this show is contemporary, but I did want to, to feel very timeless. And, you know, Ryan Murphy right away when we met for season one said he wanted it to be very aspirational and this is a very heightened world. Um, but we still really wanted it to be playful. We used a lot of bold color that was really important for us and really key for the aesthetic of the show. We wanted um, each character to have a really unique color palette that was pretty specific to only their wardrobe. Um, also, we wanted everyone's closet to be inspired by icons and less con contemporary influence. So for example, um, Alice and Peyton in that last shot, um, Still very fashionable, but classic, timeless, more mature than season one. So politically influenced by, you know, the um, Kennedys. Alice is very inspired by um, First Lady style of Jackie Onassis. And we followed that with palette as well as silhouette. So she was very, um, she dressed in sheath dresses, you know, more red and blue this season. Um, creams, less sherbet tones, you know, and same for everyone else. We looked at Annie Hall for McAfee. We looked at um, 
Slim Aaron's photography for Gwyneth Paltrow's character, Georgina, and were influenced by um, icons like CZ Guest and Talitha Getty, um, and really wanted it to feel, you know, like this very heightened aspirational world where each, each character was so unique to themselves and their aesthetics would only work on them. You also have the character Astrid, and mm -hmm. she seems to have this cat and mouse chase yeah. with the other character, Hadassah, played by Bette Midler. Yeah. And then they're so different, but then they start to have similarities. How did that composition come together? Yeah, that was actually um, something right from the start. We, they're really bold, brassy, strong women. And we um, talked a lot about how their character styles would have crossover. So mm. I, lose, I use a lot of 80s influence for their color palettes, bringing in um, fuchsias and teals. And they also were the ones to wear the most leather and you know, knee boot, knee high boots, and also bold, fun jewelry. Those were the two who were not afraid of embellishment, like over accessorizing, you know, big faux fur collars. Um, we wanted their styles to be parallel because they are kind of the ones scheming behind everyone's backs in um, big, bold ways. And um, yeah, that was kind of how we wanted to bring that to life. There was a scene where, um, and that they were just sitting in together. Outside of that in season one, Astrid is wearing a faux fur jacket, uh, something from Marc Jacobs, and then Hadassah is wearing a vintage Burberry metallic, and they're chasing each other in that cat and mouse situation. And we just wanted their textures to really play off one another. And um, they always also were hiding behind huge fun sunglasses. Um, and. That was just something that was really important to us as the season went on, just to keep their color palette similar, but also, as you said, very different and influenced by different things. Um, you know, there was uh, Astrid w would wear a brand new Louis Vuitton monogrammed jacket, but then she'd wear an 80s bubble skirt with it in black, all black head to toe with a pop of pink fuchsia. So um, yeah, we just had so much fun. Those These women are like, there were so many strong, powerful women in the show. And that was a really fun um, part of the process, bringing that, their um, bold style to life. Well, and Astrid has that very Lower East Side New York quality about her, even though she's from originally, her character is from California. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the image number two, where you have Dee Dee Standish, um, uh, who's the incumbent senator. Mm -hmm. And she's the one character of all the people who's in the black and white with some pops of color or some of your neutrals. Yeah. In complete contrast to her chief of staff, Hadassah Bette Midler, like in those cr incredible saturated jewel tones, yeah. accessories to the nines. Um, uh, how did you uh, collage the two of them together so that they look like two very different people, but they are a team running this campaign? Yeah, we looked for like in that image, that's a really, I think, I'm not sure what year, I think it's 80s or 90s Dior suit um, that I found at the Real Real. And then we added an Etro scarf into the collar and then big bold turquoise jewelry. Um, so a lot of her pieces were even, either made um, or we source vintage. Dee Dee on the opposite end was, you know, very, very streamlined and political. We wanted her to wear, as you said, mostly neutrals with navies and reds, but she did have some um, less political moments. There are scenes yeah. where she's meeting with another senator and she's wearing a really bright red suit and then leather pleated, like box pleated skirt with black, high knee high boots and that was her off the clock you know i wanted her to still be bold and have some similar influences as hadassah and kind of some scheming behind her back as well you know she she's not innocent she also has some vulnerability at home she wore a lot of white and creams you know some softer knits um and hadassah as well at her home she um wore silks and other soft materials and we wanted them both to have these um, 
specific color palettes, but also, you know, crossover and parallel pieces, like lots of leather and, um, yeah, and they also always cared about their jewelry, and that was something I wanted them both to um, care about. And um, although they are um, very different in color palette, they always wear big, chunky, you know, jewelry as well, earrings and brooches and things that they, you know, they both can, um, yeah, they both care about as well. You also, you have the incredible Gwyneth Paltrow, mm -hmm. and uh, she has such a unique wardrobe where it's very California, yeah. and you brought the caftan back to the forefront of all the fashion blogs. Yeah. And you still, even though you had them in season one, you repeat it again. There's nothing like a beach scene with a red caftan. Yeah. Yeah, um, we did not, Georgina was one of the characters who doesn't full-time move to New York. So we didn't want her to lose her very Palm Springs, California, Slim Aaron's influence wardrobe. So we kept her in caftans, like that Pucci one on the beach. Um, we borrow a lot of clothing from designers for her. So, you know, in that scene, you sh that clip you showed, she's wearing a beautiful blue moray, Oscar de la Renta jumpsuit and she's like smoking hookah in our house. You know, she has this like bohemian style that like would never in real life, you wouldn't see any politician wearing any of these pieces. Even her campaign, it's like very ridiculous and over the top and so right. style. Complete unexpected campaign messaging. Yeah. Um, and then you have, let's look at uh, image number three, where you have infinity. Um, where her whole focus is on sustainability and climate change. How did you reinforce that character's uh, goals? Yeah, Infinity, um, you know, this season she's more free spirited, more bohemian inspired of the bunch. And she also um, is obviously caring very much about her sustainable ethos. So when we were uh, conceptualizing, you know, her character's closet, we talked a lot, my assistant costume designer and I, about how we can portray this in a real, you know, a real way where it feels authentic to the character. So we decided we wanted to keep uh, her clothing almost all reclaimed, upcycled, or put her in um, sustainable designers like Rachel Comey and other designers who really have a, um, environmentally minded ethos. So a lot of her clothes were vintage. Um, she still wore a lot of designer, but it would be like <laughs> a Stella McCartney from 15 years ago, you know, some pieces that we would just style in, you know, the way infinity would, which is like kind of childish and silly, and but at the same time, um, you know, stay aligned with her ethos. We also kept her color palette very um, green and blue and kind of like earth tones. Um, and yeah, that was kind of our goal for her. And we hope that came across. <laughs> very much so, very much so. Now, I have a question for all three of our panelists. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is how do you see your role as a collaborator with the actors? Do you ever, did? you must discover moments where you find costume pieces that then become part of that narrative. Are you using the costume pieces? It seems like you are to create all this intrigue and backstory of who each of these characters are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a good example of that would be McAfee on our show, you know, from our first fitting and even conceptualizing the character, we thought about um, her wearing suiting only because she cared so much about uh, Peyton's campaign. And we didn't want her to have a lot of time to think about her outfit. So although this wearing a suit all the time looks like you're so put together and you've thought it out, you know, many times, we wanted it to almost be as though she had didn't have time to think about her outfit. So she just had a closet full of different colored suits with different shapes and yeah all different silhouettes inspired by the 70s suiting, um, you know, big lapels, wide leg pants, and then slim fitting 90s suits to oversized 80s. 
you know, we wanted that to be her aesthetic for her character. And when we, she came for a fitting, you know, we wanted it almost to seem like she just stepped into it. So that even meant we didn't tailor the pieces to mm. the nines. We kept it like very much oversized, a little ill-fitting, but still looking good, so styled. So she was wearing an 80s suit. We'd shove up the sleeves, you know, we would have the shirt untucked very much effortless in style. And that was something that came to life in a fitting. You know, that is one of those true magics and favorite parts of doing a fitting is seeing this actor come to life. And when you, when they walk out of the fitting that, you know, to have an actor look at you and say, thank you so much. I've really figured out who this character is through their style. And this has helped me figure out their, um, you know, what they care about and what they're inspired by that is kind of, the magic of what we do. Well, you really made, you found a way that they all like have full ownership of who they are and what they are wearing throughout the whole course of the series. It's quite fantastic. Thank you. Your insight is incredibly inspirational for our students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Our next guest is Wendy Partridge, streaming in from Canada. She has created tons of epic costumes for more than 71 projects, including Thor, The Dark World, Hellboy, Hell on Wheels, and Silent Hill. And she has an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Costumes for AMC series Broken Trail. Wendy is also the winner of the Canadian Screen Actors Awards Achievement in Costume Design for her incredible work on the project Pompeii. Now, let's see our first clip of scenes featuring the costume designs for Shadow and Bone. General. It's art. Well, that's art, it's art. I do hope you're both enjoying the festivities. I must confess, I'm not bored. I quite like it. In that clip, and with this next image, we just got a glimpse of Alina, the main female character's presentation ceremony in an imperial-inspired court with 18th century overtones. But this project is a complex story with at least five major cultures and military factions. Wendy, could you briefly walk us through your mashup of Prussian, Russian, Nordic, Celtic, Mongolian, even Asian, African, and early American gangs of New York? Could you walk us through that process of researching all those different cultures and then assimilating that into this incredible story? One of the biggest challenges for Shadow and Bone was the fact that it encompasses many different cultures. And um, our, uh, the book writer, Lee Bardugo, created this incredible world where um, it touched on all these different ethnic backgrounds. So we have, um, our Russian-Prussian uh, main body of the show, which is Ravka. We touch on Nordic and Asian, Black and Celtic, and all of these different worlds, different ethnic qualities. Um, we try to draw the essence of it out and bring it into our world, to our design, so that it wasn't, we weren't replicating something from, from our, our real world. We wanted it to touch on the real world so that people felt like, there was something that they were familiar with, but it was Shadow and Bone's own version of it. And that gave the show a wonderful eclectic texture that um, particularly comes together in Ketterdam, where it's the boiling pot of all these different worlds, where we see all these different cultures touch, touch um, the characters and the places that we see there. Um, and it just gives, it, it allows uh, shadow and bone to have its own umbrella feeling it is its own show it is not a replication it isn't a um, historical reproduction um, of the 18th century it is it is literally um, its own body and hoping that people um, are comfortable with the touches that we bring in that are other ethnic 
um, in, uh, communities that we see in our show. In this next image, you have we see these incredible saturated cultures, but our main character, Alina, is in the Ravkin Olive Army Fatigues. What was interesting when I looked at the series is that you had a way of being able to identify, the viewer is able to identify the individuality of each of these characters. Do you have any tricks of how you define their characters from the map makers to the commanders? A little bit obviously is done with rank, but there was a lot in how each of the performers are wearing their military attire. A big part of Shadow and Bone is the fact that there are um, basically two armies that we build. Um, there was a lot of uniforms in our show, but our main um, first army was 500 costumes of military personnel. And a lot of our um, main characters were part of that army. And we therefore needed to try and um, separate them from the background and make them identifiable. Also part of this, um, the story behind this army is that they've been warring for a hundred or hundreds of years, and it's been going on for a very long time. This isn't, you know, go out and get 500 uniforms made, all looking exactly the same. We wanted to get the feeling that these had been passed down from generation to generation so that they were um, from different dialogues, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I did was rather than ordering, you know, 3,000 meters of olive gray material, I went around and bought as many different kinds and types and colors of olive e drab material and made sometimes even just one pair of pants out of a, a small piece of cloth so that it gave the army this incredible um, sort of subtle texture through the whole thing. So there are different, different weights of material, different um, weaves of material and many different shades and then selected certain elements of those for our principal characters. So um, it, we, we made sure that this character was slightly lighter or this character was slightly darker or slightly thicker. Um, and then besides the rank, which we obviously designed an entire army's rank and all of the paraphernalia that goes with an army, we also did things like Mal, who's our tracker, gave him, and all the trackers gave them a wonderful um, leather, Eastern European feeling vest that separated him out from the, the other folks around him. For Alina, we, you know, initially starting off, she has this Ravkin scarf that was handed down from her mother that she loses very early on, but it was very precious to her. So there were little things that we were able to do to bring our characters off the screen and away from the background and give them their individuality that they needed to be introduced through our, our new amazing story. In this image, we have another view of this sumptuous court of the Grigias. So the Grigias are, are magical characters, but what's incredible is that their costumes have magical powers. Every costume designer loves that. Can you elaborate on what these beautiful robes are? So um, one of the, the biggest um, elements of our costume department for Shadow and Bone was the Grisha's keftas. And um, when Lee Bardugo wrote the book, she spent a lot of time um, putting a lot of details about these keftas and what they did and why they wore them through the books. Every color of kefta was for a specific group of disciplines. And then each kefta had to have, um, each different color had several different subcategories of um, qualities or gifts that these people had. So if they could manip manipulate water, they were a tide maker. If they could manipulate fire, they were an inferni. And each one of those disciplines had their own graphic embroidery design. So um, there were about 250 different individual keftas that we had to make with all of this bullion embroidery. But on top of that, they all had to be bulletproof, but it allowed for the storyline 
where particularly um, one of the breaches keeps getting shot in the same place. So Ivan keeps getting shot in the same place over and over. And, you know, it, it protects him, it protects him, it protects him a little less as he keeps getting shot in the same place. So when the so these keftas are a form of armor as well as decorative. It wasn't just a decorative um, treatment. It was a big part of Lee's story through the books. And um, it's a nice, when you, you know, you get in on cl close-ups, you get a nice little subtle, I mean, that this protective quality to the fabric exists. In this image, we're seeing Alina actually wearing one of these incredible keftas. This is just incredible. This, the craftsmanship, the artistry of how these garments were made. Uh, I understand they were made in Budapest. Could you elaborate on the process of how these robes came about, how they were made, um, how they were inspired by the book and how you came up with the, the embroidery motifs? It's just so incredibly well done. And so all of these um, motifs that we, we see in the Keftas, um, there was a, a huge amount of graphic research done um, as to how they should be shown. Um, I did I did lots of research in, in, in ways to have this embroidery depict all these different disciplines and came up with this almost um, graffiti-esque version of the graphics. So it felt slightly modern and not of the curly cue time that we were, you know, we're, we're more or less in. All of the embroidery is bullion and it's all done by hand. It was a massive undertaking. And we had, it was 250 or 300 um, embroidered in, in, well, all the fabric and everything was done in India. The printing and everything was done there because the printing had to happen before the embroidery. And it was all hand done in India. They would print, they would embroider the, the material flat. They would ship it to us. We would then cut the patterns out and then the keftas themselves were fabricated in Budapest with an amazing um, team that I had there. The crafts people there were amazing and just did such beautiful work. Uh, I, this show wouldn't have been the way it is with, without the team that we had in Budapest. I'm very, very, very impressed with the skills and artisans that we found there. And it was a labor of love. These keftas were a lot of work. So um, I'm, I'm happy that they shine in the show because they were a really big part of our department. In this last image, we see these three rogue characters and they're wearing a very similar silhouette. They're called the Kirsch. They are similar to what Claire was talking about, where Claire has a mashup of 1960s, 1980s politicians. What it seems what's happening here is you have this mashup of 1920s New York gangsters with Victorian 19, I mean, 1890s, 1880s Victorian gangs or the gangs of New York. And there's this mashup of two totally different time periods, all coming together in these three different characters. How did that come about? So one of the really fun parts of this show was designing costumes for the crows. Kaz, Jesper and Inej were such fun characters. They, they kept changing clothes and taking on identity, other people's identities. I wanted to give these characters attitude at all times. They, they, they are such personalities. And it's also quite a challenge when you have to try and design something that's gonna fit teeny tiny um, Inej and you know, tall, handsome Kaz in the, same, in the same costume. That happens a couple of times and you're like, okay, this is going to be challenging because she's like you know, 50 pounds soaking wet. Um, but it comes across as really fun and um, gives the show one more layer and level of cheekiness and and just you know trying we tried not to take the costumes really serious and if you do this silhouette that's wrong or if you do that silhouette that's wrong it has to be in this envelope 
that's not the show. The show is Shadow and Bones show. This is their look. And there's lots of lovely flexibility that gets us to manipulate this three characters in particular into all kinds of looks and trouble. Wendy, thank you so much for all of your insight and sharing the process for your incredible work on Shadow and Bone. You're welcome. <laughs> Our next guest is Ellen Morajnik, and she has been nominated twice for a BAFTA and Emmy Award winning uh, the Emmy for Behind the Candelabra. She's also been nominated by her peers on multiple occasions for the Costume Designers Guild Awards, winning for Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, the Behind the Candelabra, the Nick, and in 2016, she was honored with the Costume Designers Guild Career Achievement Award. The list of prominent filmmakers Ellen has designed for is quite extensive, including Steven Soderbergh, Steven Spielberg, Oliver Stone, Paul Verhoeven, Tony and Ridley Scott, Catherine Bigelow, and J.J. Abrams, just to name a few. But she's most known for her original work with Michael Douglas on Wall Street, Basic Instinct, and Fatal Attraction. Now, let's take a look at the next scene clips which features a multitude of characters in Ellen Morajnik's Regency period costumes on Bridgerton. Princess in Cossida. It rolls right off the tongue, does it not? So, Ellen. Hi, Chrissy. Let's talk about eye candy. Does it get any better? <laughs> I don't really think so. I think that that is the most eye candy that um, has ever come together on one project. But that's so delicious, I have to think. It is quite delicious. It's like a smorgasbord of beautiful desserts, right? <laughs> and what you also have accomplished in Bridgerton, which happened during transition periods like 1813, I think that's the time when this takes yes. place, that you have a glimpse of the past of the, of the 18th century and a little bit of a nod to where the, the Regency period is with those higher waistlines. And it has a, it's a filter of the contemporary sensibilities for color. How did you take all these time periods and these, these color tableaus to distill it into what has become the iconic images for Bridgerton? Um, distill it, is a, that's a very, very good word, actually. But first and foremost, what I did and what I think we all do at the very, very beginning is do the research thoroughly of what the time that your piece is taking place in. Ours was 1813. Um, and really understand what the silhouettes were, the construction of the silhouettes, male, female, and so on. Because without understanding the very foundation, there is no way that I believe you can abstract the form and create a universe that is onto itself. And what we always felt was that in this particular piece, Bridgerton, although it is a period piece, mm -hmm. it is not a period lesson and that we were not recreating history. It was not to be used as a, 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 a period lesson. It was to be used in a way that would just um, sweep you into this magical, f mm -hmm. uh, fantastical period type world that would actually create a feeling and a notion of 1813. I liken it to um, reading a romance novel that takes place at that time. Your imagination runs wild. You're not looking at the exactness of where is the line, where is the armhole, nor are you looking at the exactness of where is the bonnet? And in our world, it was bonnetless. It was purposely bonnetless. 
when we went to create this world, there are a few things that had to come first besides the research of what actually existed. Um, our creator, Chris Van Dusen, did create and wanted to create a bonnetless world. He did not want to create a history lesson. Let's look at uh, image number two. Okay. Of this bonnetless world. So here they are all outside. And this period is known for bonnets and mm. especially to be outside and not have the shade on their face. But it's off with the bonnets, put them under a little shade of a tent, and then they all just look like they're like fresh flowers out of the perfect English garden. Um, that is a really good analogy, isn't it? But you know what we did with the bonnets? I mean, to, to just um, go off track for a half a second. Yeah. We, what we did with the bonnets, because the shape of the bonnet, the brim of the bonnet is so pretty that those semicircular mm. shapes, we then reinterpreted it and did it for hair pieces. We never, we never alluded to, oh, here is Penelope wearing a bonnet type hairpiece or anybody else along along the track we we didn't do that but we created different shapes pertaining to the millinery of the time but we reinterpreted them mm -hmm. as hair pieces hair accessories and not anything that would um be really misconstrued as 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 a bonnet or hat but i in, in doing this and working with Shondaland, there is um, an edict, and that edict is always aspirational. Um, what we did, of course, is that we shifted the color palette to be actually very similar, as I've learned later, to a palette, a Regency palette. But we, of course, don't know what a Regency palette is because all we see are um, prints. prints or faded, yeah. but really faded, faded paintings. Yep, yep. Faded, faded paint, faded prints, faded everything that right. gives a grayish and a beige and a muslin type appearance to what the period was, which was very colorful. I, at, Ellen, hold on one sec. Let's look okay. at image number three because this shows that very saturated palette with yes. clashing of all these beautiful prints. And even when you do the interiors, your production design was also yes. equally saturated. And, and going back to your lookbook, what's incredible is hearing your discussing how you used the lookbook as the costume designer and the first person on board of this project and how then it then communicated that concept to the production designer, cinematographer, your actors. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Yes, it was, um, it, it was a great tool, a great, great tool because we felt the interpretation of what was being asked of us by Chris Van Dusen and Shonda and Shonda and Shonda Rhimes and Betsy Beers was that it would be really important for everyone to be on the same page. And that meant everyone, every single person mm -hmm. that could potentially have a point of view. It was hugely important that they saw exactly what we saw. And so the time put into our lookbook, yes, from the palette on through Queen Charlotte and all of the other characters, is that if you looked at the book, you would understand immediately. But immediately, it was it, it was not anything that oh, let me go back and think about it. If you, if somebody said let me go back and think about it, then there would have been a different discussion. But we we were able to hit it on the nose from the get go, and just run from there. We didn't walk and take our time because of time and necessity to deliver. But that was all part of the most fabulous experience that I have ever had. In that 
it was, I would say, the most enormous challenge, the most enormous challenge. And um, the most, uh, it, one of the biggest challenges was creating a costume house because all of right, what we created right. what did not exist. Nothing existed. So everything had to be done from soup to nuts. Let's take a look at image number four and do a bit of a dive to talk about your two main actors in this project. You have Daphne, who seems to be somehow inspired by Audrey Hepburn, mm -hmm. and then um, the Duke, Simon, uh, he seems to have a more continental global backstory to his character. How did that all come about when you started, when you shared the lookbook with these principal characters? And then what was that evolution when you go into the fitting room to help create the characters with these performers? Well, I have to say that with Phoebe, Phoebe actually- Who plays was, Daphne. She plays Daphne, Phoebe yeah. plays Daphne. And she was an, a, a beautiful English rose. She mm. was a beautiful English rose. She has very, very delicate, uh, delicateness about her that she could only carry a particular amount, which led immediately to an elegance, the cleanliness and, and um, uh, just the simpleness I would say cleanliness. No, I wouldn't say that. It's really the 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 um, the simpleness of a pure line. Um, her decoration is not as bold as other characters. She is a perfect. She is perfectly filigreed in a way um, as a beautiful, beautiful Tiffany blue portrait would be mm -hmm. that you find somewhere else. She did have the innocence of Audrey Hepburn. And then yeah. with, um, with Duke Simon, he had, you, you were telling me that he has this whole backstory that got created during the course or the evolution in the fitting room. Yes, um, each and everybody's story before going into Simon's, I will say, each and everybody, when they came into the fitting room, they'd already seen the book. There you go. <laughs> everybody, but, but they came in with like, really, what? You know, big question marks and big eyes because they expected a different world. They expected that faded world we just spoke of before. They not seen a world that we were in the process of creating, which left them just brilliantly open to what they were going to become, what was going to evolve. They were so oh. curious. They were just, oh, really? I'll try that. I'll try that. What color? Oh, okay. They were just like kids in a candy store, which is ever so wonderful for us. Um, when it came to Simon, Simon actually was the last person that um, of the principal cast, I believe that we did fit. And he came in and he was wonderful to create and wonderful to work with. What we had to do first was create a silhouette for him what he could wear, what he couldn't wear, because we did stick with very, um, the you know, real, um, we did change actually the trousers a bit. We did put flies in the trousers as opposed to non-flies. Right. Right. Yes, we did, we did make it a little simpler, um, but it wasn't to be accepted accented in any or shown in any particular way. But we did try to initially establish his silhouette. And what we found was, number one, he would not wear white pants. Number two, he'd always wear tall boots. Number three, his shirts would always be open. And that was a big deal. And with so that- wear the cravat, the, the whole stuffy, like claustrophobic, no, nope. his was to be always open. He was the only character that could wear black. 
he could always wear a particular kind that we tried about six different styles of um, jackets on him. We came to the one that was absolutely perfect in its shape. It's quite handsome and quite manly. Um, we raised the the depth of his collar because Simon actually has a reggae has actually a very long neck. So it was really important for his jaw to be embraced by the, the yeah. height of the collar. We then took the cravat, turned it into a scarf, and put it inside of his shirt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Inside of his shirt. But what was most important to him in these travels, and because of the difficulty of his childhood that he wanted to take with him everywhere, a piece of his mother. And so Lady Danbury gave him one of his mother's brooches yes. very, very early on. And he wears it on his lapel of his waistcoat throughout the entire hmm. series. Hmm. But that being said, we created the world of Simon, the right, Duke, right. Duke of Hastings, where he came from, where he traveled to, his spirit, which was only independent. He had no intention of marrying whatsoever. He wanted to come in and get out. Right, right. And obviously, we know the story now, but <laughs> it happened all in the fitting room. Well, this is the perfect example of showing how costume design is a collaborative art form. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've talked about in the past is that one of the key roles as a costume designer is our ability to communicate those ideas, to hear what people are saying and to communicate those ideas. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. You're very yeah. Thank you. Always. I wanted to ask you if you could give a tip of career advice for our, our students who are part of this event this week. Um, and do you have any tips for uh, helping them enter into the entertainment business? Yeah. Um, I think the number one thing I would say, just thinking back on what I wish I knew at that time, is um, to seek out um, inspiration everywhere and to keep curious. That means seeking out art and travel and food and everything that kind of lights you up and keeps you inspired. You have to um, follow those things that light you up so that you do fill up your own cup and, you know, Feed your soul that so that you're supported even by yourself and nurtured. And so you have the space to be creative. There is so much richness that unfolds when you're constantly seeking inspiration and art. And I think that is um, something I would advise all humans, but definitely um, something I wish I knew when I was entering the workforce and, you know, interning in fashion as well as um, starting in the costume world with PAing. I think that, you know, you feel, you overwork yourself sometimes because you feel like you need to in order to keep um, up with everything that's going on because there's so much going on, but there's always going to be so much going on. So slow down and appreciate and see everything around around you and yeah stay curious it's the most important thing i could ever tell anyone wendy do you have any advice for the young designers presenting their work at design showcase west and tips for them entering this career of wanting to be designers and visionaries for the entertainment industries of theater film and television I've been doing this uh, job for a very long time, designing costumes, and it's certainly my passion. And I've met lots of young people that it, it's their passion, would like, they would like it to be their passion. And um, I think if I could give them any advice, it's never be afraid to go with your gut. I think the one thing that um, steps one designer away from another is somebody that's a, a bit fearless. You're, you're not afraid to 
push the envelope. If you, if you, this is not a job that you can calculate and say, you know, one and one makes two, two and two makes four. four. And that's the answer. The answer to the design of great costumes is the instinct and the feeling that you get from the characters and the script and and really living in living it and um, using that as the embodiment of your inspiration is what's inside of you. That's what gives the push out. You can do, you know, obviously research is a huge um, base and structural backbone to whatever project you're doing, but it's your own instinct and your own gut that will get you um, moving forward and just be a squeaky wheel because just push yourself, push yourself, push yourself out there to do whatever's in your heart. Could you give some advice to our young uh, MFA graduating design students who are presenting at DSW? Could you give them a little insight on um, listening more and communicating to share our ideas as designers? Well, Chrissy, you have said it all. My advice to everyone who is beginning their path um, on their journey um, is to, I use an expression uh, that K Chrissy is referring to and that I love, and it is to walk in beauty. Mm -hmm. And what that really entails is the art of communication, the art of listening, the art of authenticity, the art of, of being truthful to who you are, to your passions, having the confidence, and most importantly, being able to communicate it. Communication is, this, this is the world that we live in. We live in the world as designers, of communication, what's so very, very important is to be able to communicate your ideas, of course. But at the same time, it is equally as important to listen to other ideas, to listen really, really thoroughly, to understand the director, to understand the producers, to understand if there's a conflict between both. As the costume designer, you are the one in charge of knitting it together and of making it appear to be seamless, not saying, oh, no, you know, you go back with your team and decide how to do this. But without communication, without the art of listening, without the art of really being true to yourself and being able to express your ideas and collaborate together with the, with the entirety of the project. That's, in my opinion, that's 90% of the job. It's not, your, you have your talent, you have your passion. And I say that, I say walk in beauty because then you will be fully authentic to yourself, right. to what your passions are. But part of that is please learn to communicate and listen. Yeah, yeah. And now in closing, an extra thank you to Ellen Mirajnik, who you can tell was one of my, I actually assisted Ellen several decades ago as one of her assistant costume designers. But a special thank you to all three of our guest panelists, Claire Parkinson, the politician, Wendy Partridge for Shadow and Bone, and Ellen Mirajnik, the costume designer on Bridgerton. Thanks to each of you for sharing your costume design magic, and I wish you each the best of luck for this year's Emmy 2021 season considerations. For our fellow voting costume design guild members in the audience, please don't forget to cast those votes for this year. And on a final note to our audience, I entreat you to not only watch these projects on Netflix, but you may want to watch them twice to catch all these different secrets about the creation of the costume designs for The Politician, Shadow and Bone, and Bridgerton, all on Netflix. We are now at the end 
of the festival, but the website for Design Showcase West will be available to view for an entire year. I invite all of our guests, our panelists, all of our industry professionals, please take a look at the website and check out the students' portfolio galleries. They will be so honored just to have a meeting so that they could share their work and share their training that they have acquired over the last three years of getting their Masters of Fine Arts. And to our student presenters, we all wish you the best of luck and can't wait to see you in the halls and corridors of all the different costume houses in the States and abroad. So best of luck to the class of 2021.